Great to have you here. Hey, uh, love you. It's good to hear. Listen, if you're here with us for the first time or the first time in a long time, welcome home. Welcome home. Hey, real quick, I want to uh, give you some information. Some of you have been made aware via Facebook or text messages from other people or so forth, but let me just uh, be the first to uh, make the announcement from the front up here. Some crummy news. Uh, many of you know Mike and Monica Waite. Uh, they volunteer at the church. They've been here with us for quite a while. Um, Mike, unfortunately, uh, two days ago, passed away of a massive heart attack. So uh, you know them. They sit right up here in the corner here. Um, you know them. They're related to Dave and Heather Waite, Pastor Heather. Uh, Pastor Heather, it's, it's their brother-in-law. It's Dave's brother. Uh, but you also know there are other family, uh, my, our Barbara and Dave Sr., who also go to church here. So their whole family, three families, plus sister also goes to church here. So there's a lot going on. So Mike, unfortunately, um, two days ago, passed away of a massive heart attack early in the morning. Uh, got a phone call, and they're dealing with that, all of the goings-on of that. So keep in mind that there's children, there's cousins, nieces, nephews. It's a lot. I hate death. There's this sting that comes to death, and it's, it shouldn't happen. Uh, the, 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 the part of death that every one of us hates it's real. The good news is that Jesus swallowed up death, right? Jesus is bigger than death. Jesus literally eradicated that, and we get the beauty of the life of Jesus because of what he did for us. And the death no longer has a sting to it. Mike's in heaven. Hallelujah. We know that. Mike and Monica have been serving up in Seattle. Perhaps you haven't seen them the last several weeks. Uh, they've been up there helping Dave and Heather launch their new, their new assignment up in Seattle, up at the gathering place, and uh, perhaps uh, the gathering place, uh, they might even be tuning in right now. So we love you, Dave and Heather and Monica. We love you, Barb and Dave as well, and all your family. Uh, we pray for you, um, Malia, Makai, and, and we know the pain of what you're walking through. We're all here to love and care for you as well. So we love the gathering place. Uh, we love what you're, what you're, you're walking through. And we're going to do everything we can to carry you along in this journey. So we got a church full of people all sitting around you, and we're all praying for you as well. So let's continue to do that um, as they're tuning in, perhaps, or a part of what we're doing. And there's nothing easy about this journey, right? You know, it's funny. When, when we bump into death, Oftentimes it brings us back to that moment of somebody either we loved or cared about or might even bring back somebody who's really close to you or maybe even you confront your own version of fear or your own mortality. Oftentimes we get to this moment and we're, we're like, ah, gosh, there's a, a finiteness to this life we have. I just want you to know, man, this is the reminder for us to draw close to Jesus and to draw close to each other, yeah. right? There's a, there's, a, there's a finiteness to this life here on earth. As I was praying for you and us and them on the way into church today, um, I, I was a music major in college, and, and sometimes um, in classical music, uh, there are operas and there are all kinds of, uh, a lot of times in a classical music, there are movements and songs and different There'll be a fast movement, there'll be a slow movement, there'll be a choppy movement, there'll be different things. And sometimes I was thinking about that on the way in here and how life kind of mimics that whole journey. That sometimes in life there are these slow moments and fast moments and um, really long legato movements and, and sometimes there's even movements that seem really painful. This feels like one of those. Because it doesn't seem fair or right that a young man would be taken. I don't like it. You don't have to like it. I just want us to pray for them. So, some of you um, have been asked, or I've been asking, how do we care for? How do we love? How do we come alongside? And, and I will tell you up on the screens, I don't know if we have up on the screens, but if not, you can go to our website. 
um, in our website. You can go click the give button. And some of you are like, how can we give towards um, maybe helping with the funeral costs and all that stuff? And there, there's ways you can go to our benevolence. You click give and there's a drop down menu and there's a, a benevolence tab. Is that correct? And it'll say, it'll say weights benevolence. And on that, you can go there and give to that. And it will, it will help, you know, some of that cost because, you know, come on, it's expensive for all of that stuff. And so if you'd like to do that, then feel free to, but there's certainly no, no need to make that happen. But if you'd like to, it just feels, so as I was talking to somebody today, they were like, I just feel like we can't do enough. And it's true. But here's what I know we can do. Let's pray for them right now. Right? Can, can I just ask you just to grab a hand next to you? Just reach across. Maybe you can grab a hand. Jesus, this stinks. There's nothing about this that makes or feels natural or normal. In fact, quite frankly, some of it feels so, uh, I don't know, kind of angering. God, we lift up Monica to you. Will you just be her peace right now? Just as I was talking to her on the phone last night, I know that there's just, it's just, just frustrating. It's angering, God. Will you just be with Monica, be with their kids? God, help her try to figure out that whole thing as they navigate their, their sons, their daughter. I just pray you help them with that. Lord, we lift up Dave and Heather for sure and, and their kids and, and help them to figure that out. And I know they're trying to, to, to navigate pastoring a church at the same time. We, we help them. Lord, I pray for um, Dave Sr. and Barb and, and, um, and their sister, Lord, and, and all of that. God, will you just be with them? And, and as they navigate this whole journey, we just pray for your peace over the, the entire family. Just be here, God. We need you a bunch. In Jesus' name, amen. Be praying for them uh, last, uh, last Friday, um, which just a couple days ago, remember, we've, we're in 21 United. Well, um, so are they, right? What are the odds? Pastor Heather's like, hey, hey Lance, I'm going to just copy you with what we know. And so they've been doing 21 United well, just like us. So we had 21 United last Thursday when we had our worship and prayer night, right? right here? It was tremendous. Well, they heard that morning, that that, that morning that their, that Mike had passed away. So they had a worship and prayer night that night. And Pastor Heather couldn't do it. So I went up and led, helped lead it, right? And Pastor Laura came with me. So we just went up there and loved on them at Grace Place, in Grace Place Foursquare in Burien. And you know what? The gathering place, sorry, gathering place. Um, <laughs> GP Foursquare, sorry, Gathering Place Foursquare. I know another church called Grace Place. Uh, but I'll tell you this, right? So uh, as that, I'm just saying to you, will you continue lifting them up? They're navigating this journey. They got another 21 United coming up this Friday and they don't know what in the world they're doing. So I'm gonna go up and help them again. Yeah. We're just gonna love them because we're family. I made them a video this morning telling them I'm coming. They're gonna get sick of me and we're gonna love them, right? And, and Pastor Doug's gonna go preach their next weekend. We're just going to care for them because that's what you do in your family. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. All right. Amen. Keep on loving them because you do, because you're family. Amen and amen. That's good. Well, many of you know this about me. You know that I'm not a pilot. You know that I'm not an electrician. You know that I'm not a small business owner. Many of you know that I'm not a plumber or an engineer. Most of you by now know that I'm actually a pastor. Amen? Hopefully. You're like, are you an imposter? I don't know, man. Sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes I feel like I, I, have, I have devotions in the morning, and then I end up just talking to you about my devotions. I feel like sometimes I'm going to wake up in the morning, when I'm going to wake up one day in heaven, and the Lord's going to go like, you know, that was all just for you, right? Like, so like you guys are all just going to go away, and God's going to go like, that wasn't really a church. It was just your devotion. Like, one day. I'm just kidding. Well, I, listen, Several weeks ago, I was at home. I got a phone call from Polly, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure I got it correct, but this is similar. I'm not going to look over her because she'll, she'll give me that look like I didn't say it correctly, so I'm going to tell you what I, how I think it went, all right? This is how the phone call went. Hun, um, everything's all right, right? When you get the phone call and the first thing is, hun, everything's all right, you kind of wonder, right? So, hun, everything's all right. So you get a call like that, you kind of brace yourself. She went on to say, the kids are good. She said, make sure. She said, the grandbabies, they're both good. I want you to make sure you know that, that the house is not burning. It's not on fire. 
I said, okay, good. My mom's good. I was like, okay, good. Your mom's good. That's great. And she said, hey, I just want to ask you a question. I said, what's that? She goes, um, did you read your Bible this morning? And I was like, dude, spill the beans. What are you talking about? She's like, I just, did you read your Bible? And I was like, Polly, where are you going with this? And she's like, just tell me you read your Bible. And I was like, I did. I read my Bible. She goes, where did you read your Bible? And I was like, I, I read my Bible where I always read my Bible. Upstairs in the loft, in the brown chair, I always sit in next to the table and the lamp across from this little fireplace. I do it all the time. I sit right there, right? That's where I sit. And I was like, what in the world are you talking about? She said, well, you know that dog that, that you love? And I was like, Polly? She, she said, I said, listen, I know the dog, the, the dog I love part, not so much. She said, well, he, he ate your Bible. The dog ate my Bible, right? Our dog, our dog has a name, but I never call it by name. I actually toyed with testing the all dogs go to heaven theory. I actually thought to myself, maybe this was Jesus' way of saying, Lance, I want a dog. And so I thought, Lord, this could be a way but the dog is still with us. I never call the dog by name. I've never called the dog by name. I just call him dog. And every time I say dog, come here, dog, go outside, whatever it is, Polly says, Lance, has a name. And um, I've, listen, I'm going to turn my phone over because I, last service, start getting texts from all of you telling me all the dog psychology. So stop it. Stop <laughs> texting me now. Some of you, really, it's dumb. Stop it. I'm, I'm okay. I'm emotionally stable. Look, look, right? I'm not a pilot. I'm not a plumber. This is my, this is my tool right here. This is my trade. I'm a pastor. Love of Jesus. I, I, I try not to say bad words. I did speak in tongues that morning. I, I can't... <laughs> I can't say the tongues that I say in church, for the record, I won't. You wouldn't believe I was saved. No. Keep me out of trouble. Yeah, keep me out of trouble. Well, thanks. Appreciate that. Listen, we, uh, we are in week three of 21 United. I love where God is taking our church. I love where God has us as a church. I love where God's leading us as a church. We have one more week, and perhaps you've not joined in our fast. Perhaps you've not joined in our study. I'm going to challenge you. You have one more week. Will you jump in? Uh, you saw Diana on our staff up on the announcements a minute ago inviting you to join us. Go ahead. It's not too late. I want to challenge you. Get in, man. It's not the amount of time you log. It's just the fact that you're joining in. Be a part of it. Pick something to fast. Join us in our reading. Come to our Thursday night devotional, our, our, our prayer night. This Thursday at 7 o'clock, we'll have child care. It's going to be different. Maybe you've never been to one of our, 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 our reflect prayer nights. There's going to be stations all around the church, seven different stations. Um, it's going to be amazing. If you've never done it, it'll be different. I'm, cha- I'm going to challenge you. Our first night, we, 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 we prayed uh, corporately. Second night, second Thursday night, we did uh, intercessory worship. This Thursday night, we're going to have a reflect worship night where we're going to have different ways to reflect in prayer. And, and so uh, I want to tell you, it's going to be a surprise to some of you, some of these stations you've never done before, it's going to be different. I want to I want to invade a different part of your brain and your, your, your heart because I want to challenge you to pray different than you ever have before. So come. Uh, invade is a difficult word, but I want, to challenge, I, want to, I want to get in there. I want you to pray different. It'll, it'll get down to something different in you because I feel like there's some different kind of w- prayer that God wants to get to. So come on, on, for, on, on Thursday night. Be here at 7 o'clock. It's going to be amazing. All right. And, and be a part of it. I'm telling you, it's going to be good. Listen, I grew up in a home in Enumclaw. Uh, We had five kids in our family. I was the middle of five kids. I was clearly the quietest of the five. Um, 
I, I, I am, everyone in my family, they're all small. Uh, they're, my mom's five, she was five foot one. I'm six foot four. Uh, I, my family photos, I look like Shrek in the back, right? I look like them, same body style, just large. I'm like extra large version of all of them. Uh, mom, dad got married to the stepdad, uh, stepkids. So at one point there were eight children in our home, uh, five teenage girls at any given moment. Let me just help you with this. Uh, three bedroom, one bathroom. Um, did I say that there were five teenage girls at one point, right? Yeah. One bathroom. So uh, my mom was five foot something, five foot one. And though she was very short in stature, if I closed my eyes, she was six foot four. She was a handful. Uh, she, she terrified me. Uh, she was a toughie. Man, she, she was a toughie. I can tell you that, man. She... You might look at her and see, like, Lance, her, seriously? I'm, yep, trust me. She was, she was, she could, I remember one time, this is so bad, she would go to jail today for this, but um, she's in heaven, so I can tell you the story. I remember one time, I was, a, I was a little boy, I was being bullied by a dude, and I remember um, we had an Econo van, I told the story before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, we had an Econo van where she was driving, right, and so it was 15 passenger, because, well, we needed it. We were driving, and Petey was, Petey was picking on me, right, and Petey was a thug, um, my mom sees Petey walking on the side of the road and, and she was like, Petey's bugging you again? I'm like, yeah, Petey's bugging me. She pulls over to the side of the road and she said, Petey, get over here. And so Petey's like, and she looks down and she said, Petey, I want you to know something. And Petey's like, what? She goes, if, you ever, if I ever see you on the side of the road again, walking by yourself, I will run you over. <laughs> that was it. She didn't say, don't touch my son. She didn't say anything else. She said, if I see you again, I'll run you over. And I was like, he never said a thing to me again. I don't know if I ever saw him again. I, maybe she ran him over. I don't know. All I, know I don't know. All I know is Petey it was no longer, right? So, no, I know he lived because my wife went to school with him. But, but I will tell you, that was my mom. She was terrifying, but very small on the outside, right? So, duh. She, she would always say this phrase with all eight of us at one point. She would eventually, in fact, she said it every day of my life. Um, she said this phrase. I don't even know a day that went by where she didn't say this phrase. Sometime around 10 o'clock, especially in the summertime, I have had enough. <laughs> and then usually an expletive before or after that phrase. I have had enough. And she would say it. And, and we all knew that one of us had crossed the line with one of the others and done something we shouldn't have done. Not me. But one of them. I'm certain. I have had enough, right? And I realize, like, uh, nobody does. We don't do anything, right? We never change anything in our life until we have enough. We don't change our communication with each other until there's enough. We don't start an exercise plan until we've had enough. Until the doctor says there's been enough. We don't plug the hole in the dike until there's enough. We don't change our spending habits until the bank says enough. We don't change our spiritual direction until, well, there's been enough. It's amazing, right? How do you know when you've had enough? Have enough, and then I could always tell because there would be these veins that right here. Just it'd put her eyes would get bloodshot. And she'd be like, yeah, she, yeah, she was a... I just remember she would, I would, I've had enough. And there were these moments, right? And, and I remember thinking like, I wasn't sure if I was the cause or not, but I, but I just knew that you had to get out of there, wherever there was, move, man. Because um, my mom wasn't a Bible thumper. She was a thumper. <laughs> and um, whatever was in her hand was coming your direction, right? So uh, she didn't follow the rules that we followed today. I'm just telling you. If you were near her and she had something in her hand, it was coming towards you. And, and I'm just saying to you, uh, yeah, trust me, um, she didn't follow the rules of today, right? And I'll just tell you this, they're, they're hmm. But, but I'll tell you, when she had enough, you knew it. I just wonder, do um, you think God ever has enough with us? Do you think God has ever had enough with you? Do you ever think God ever has enough of you? 
Sometimes we never get there. We never think like God has had enough. We never, we never think about God has had enough where we would actually imagine God saying, hey, look, I've had enough. We actually never say that. I mean, that seems terrible. What kind of a loving God would say, I had enough. And we can look back and we can see Sodom and Gomorrah and the time that you know, he's talking to Abraham and Lot and that whole thing. And if there's 50 righteous and 40 righteous and 30 righteous and there's this negotiation going on and Abraham's like, hey, 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 God, seriously, lighten up, man. If there's a few righteous, will you spare the city? There's another time when God's talking to Moses and he's like, Moses, I am done with humanity. And God somehow talked him off the cliff. There, there's, there, there are these times when I wonder if God ever looks at humanity today in 2024 and just says, Tacoma, I, I, look, I've had enough. Like we never think like that because we're like, God's good, he's loving. What kind of a loving God would ever create hell? God is love, love is love, love is love is God is love. What, what if God ever has enough? Is God capable of having enough? Is God capable of being God? Do we allow God to be God and able to be God in who he is? Do we make room in our lives for that? Or do we just say like, God, you are big enough to just sit in my back pocket and I'll determine how, how mad you can be. And that's it. Hmm. When is enough enough for God? If you have your Bibles, open them up to Isaiah chapter 58. There's a place in the Bible, many of you are probably familiar with this passage. Isaiah 58 shows up several times. You might have seen it in a, a Hallmark card, maybe even seen it on a, a poster somewhere, but you're probably familiar with some of the verses in Isaiah. There's plenty of places where God has had enough. This is one of those places, I think, when you look back at Scripture and see where God might have had a little bit of enough. Isaiah 58 verse 1 says this, He's speaking to Isaiah, and he says, I'll add some words here, but he says, Isaiah, tell them this, speaking to the nation. He says, shout with the voice of triumph, Isaiah. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to church, or they come to the temple every day, and they seem so delighted to hear my laws. You'd almost think that this was a righteous nation that they would never abandon its God. They love to make a show of coming to me, asking me to take action on their behalf. We have fasted before you, they say. Why are you impressed, God? We've done so much penance and you don't even notice. I will tell you why. It's because you're living for your own selves. Even while you're fasting, you keep right on oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, by bowing your heads like blade of grass in the wind. You dress like in sackcloth and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? It's interesting. God starts out here by saying to Isaiah, speak to the people with a shout. He actually says with a, the shout of a trumpet, right? It's interesting because he a trumpet blast was actually used to call people to battle. It was a it was a, a, an instrument used to, to 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 draw people's attention to get them to come to something. Literally, he's saying, Isaiah, draw people in, tell them to come and pay attention. Listen, he's saying, everyone, will you open up? Everyone, open up your doors and get here now. I got something to say. I got something to say about the nation. I got something to say about, well, you. I got something to say about y'all. Get here now. How do you know if God's had enough? Number one, God's had enough when we pretend that we know him and we don't. God has had enough when we pretend that we know him and we don't. Verse one and two say this, you act pious. In other words, you seem delighted to hear God's word. You love to make a show of coming to God. Did a little research and found out that the word pious is a funny word that we don't use very much. In fact, I don't think we use pious at all. The word pious simply means to act religious. Actually means this, to act over moral. Over moral or devoted 
mistake-free and judgmental, over-moral. It's interesting. Um, uh, I, I was talking about this in the first service, speaking in tongues, right? We're a four-square church. Talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We can talk about speaking in tongues. Um, I mentioned this last week to somebody here, right here in our church, about speaking in tongues. Um, uh, if you were to uh, spend, I don't know, 30 seconds in the presence of my wife, and you were to talk to my wife, goodness, about your dog, because she actually knows the name of my dog. Um, she cares about the name of my dog. She, she, I'm, I'm telling you, if you, were to tell, if you were to come to my wife and say, hey, Polly, I have a dog. And Polly would, Polly would do this. If you were to say, I have a dog, Polly would go, oh. And if you were to say, and his name is Snuffy, and she'd go, oh. And you were to say, and Snuffy is a poodle, she'd go, oh. And if you were to say, and Snuffy is eight years old, and she'd go, Woo. And then you were to say something else, and something else about Snuffy likes to hop up and down and loves treats, and she'd go, oh. She would, you know what? You could probably go 10 minutes with Polly and her use maybe two words of English. Now listen, I know she knows English. She was mad at me and used them yesterday. She used English like crazy yesterday on me, right? I'm just kidding. But she, I'm telling you, she knows English. But I'll tell you this. After you're done with that conversation about Snuffy with Polly, let me tell you this. You would feel built up. You know why? Because she knows how to use her spiritual heart-to-heart language with you. Now, now I can go to any theological seminary and tell them that I think speaking in tongues is like that, and they'd look at me and say I was crazy. (laughs) But I'm here to tell you, I think they're crazy. Because I think that's heart-to-heart communication. That's what speaking in tongues is, is your heart to God's heart. Right? Just a thought. Right? Now, let's take that same thought to the workplace. You're at workplace, and you're at your cubicle, and you're hacking away, and Susan comes walking into your presence, and Susan's dropping some, well, colorful words. Susan's dropping some colorful words about Pam and accounting, and she can't stand Pam and accounting because, because Pam is the blah, 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 blah. She's going for it, man, and you're sitting there trying to mind your own business. You have headphones on, but they're not turned on. You can hear everything, and she goes, I know you can hear me, and she's dropping the colorful words about Pam and accounting, and she's telling you... F-bomb that and B-bomb this and all the bombs. She's dropping them. And you're like, (sighs) right? You're hearing it all. And everything in your Christian you wants to say, I can't hear such words. I can't hear such words. And you want to push away from the table and go plug your ears and... (laughs) Or use your spiritual gift of interpretation what? So they were speaking in tongues? Oh, they were speaking the tongue, all right. What, what if you actually use the gift of interpretation and realize that Susan's just a hurting? And she doesn't know how to use real language to be, communicate that she's been hurt by Pam. And you can just say like, hey man, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know how to deal with that any better, but I'm here for you, Susan. How can I help you? Because it's difficult for all of us, isn't it? And you just, well, you just be Jesus. Because you might be the only Jesus she ever sees. Come on, sister. Don't get so offended. Use your spiritual gift of interpretation. Now, if I use that in a biblical, technical seminary and told them that that what I think gift of interpretation is, they'd probably kick me out. Is that the only way interpretation is used? No. Can it be used that way? Why not? I'm just saying to you, listen, don't be so pious that you leave Jesus here in church. Take Jesus with you to your workplace. I remember going to Costco one time. I worked there for 11 years. And I remember bringing my Bible into the break room thinking I was such a Christian, showing up there. And I was just like, I'm going to read my Bible. I left it on the break room table. And I'm like flipping it over and just showing people how good I was. And I was like, sometimes I would mumble the words out loud. Thus saith the Lord. I would just go for it, right? Thinking like someone's going to get it. I put my headphones in and I just sing the songs out loud. And I was like, people are going to get the word of God because I'm sitting around them. One day, then one time I left it on the break room table, came back at lunchtime, and somebody had squirted mustard in it, shut it, and threw it in the garbage. And I was like, oh, persecution has come to me. 
I was like, no, because you're just an idiot, Lance. You're just being an absolute dummy. Why don't you just love people? Why don't you just love people where they're at and stop trying to be so pious? And so from that, that day forward, I was like, just be Jesus to people. And so then I started realizing that when Jesus actually shared Christ with people, Jesus just showed up and he'd be walking along with people and he would say, um, you know what? Solomon and all of his splendor wasn't, wasn't as beautiful as the flowers over there. And, you know, it's like, it's like the path. There's like a hard path and a soft path and a, a fertile path. And he's like, he just used where he was. Jesus just used where he was. Why don't we just share Jesus like that and just be where you are? Sometimes we let our goofy weirdness just repel people instead of draw people. You don't have to compromise to be Jesus. Don't compromise to be Jesus. Just be Jesus. Jesus didn't compromise to be Jesus. Jesus was just Jesus. That's deep. Tweet that. You get that, right? Sometimes we get, just get so weird about it. All right. Number two. Number two. How do, how do we know when God's had enough? Number two. God has had enough when our eyes get too focused on ourselves. Our eyes get too focused on ourselves. It's nothing more stomach turning than a godly person whose eyes are solely focused on themselves. Nothing more stomach turning, man. We see somebody who's just like, look at me. I'm the greatest. I'm the most godly. Looking at the room. They hover when they walk into a room and you're just like, oh, that's the godly person. We have to stay. Stop it. You put your pants on just like everyone else does. You just be normal. Stop being so weird. Amen? That's why we, you, God, amen. Sorry. Held back. Um, listen, Proverbs 16.8 says this, 16.18. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. It's better to live humbly with the poor than to share plunder with the proud. Luke 14.11 says this, for the proud will be humbled, but the humble will be honored. 1 Corinthians 8, 2 and 3 say this, anyone who claims to know God Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one who, know, who, is the one who God knows and cares for. Number three, I'll, I'll finish this up. Number three, God has had enough. How do you know when God has had enough? God has had enough when we're just going through the motions. Some of us are just going through the motions. Some of us are just flat going through the motions. Some of us are going through the motions in our marriages. Some of us are going through the motions at work. Some of us are going through the motions at church. Some of us are coming through the motions when we're just lifting our hands, singing the songs. We're like, you will never fail. You will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never We just get like that. He will never fail. Come on. Sad thing is, is this looks pretty normal. He will never fail. I do it. Come on now. If I do that in church, by the way, don't come up and punch me. I'm just saying to you, someone's going to do that. They're going to be in the front row. They're going to be like, Lance. Listen. Don't fake it. You're going to have to check your phone sometimes in worship. Relax. I'm just saying to you. Don't fake it. L listen, I'm going to read a passage of scripture to you. Look at Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Open, open your Bible. Can you get to Psalm 50? One of my favorite psalms. Dog did not chew that passage. <laughs> I would have sent him to heaven for that. Listen, sorry, somebody's going to get so mad at me. Do not text me about that. All right. Okay, Psalm 50. Listen to this. Listen to this. I'll be done in a minute. The Lord Almighty, the Lord is the mighty one of, I'm sorry, the Lord, the mighty one is God. He has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets. From Mount Zion, from Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty. God shines in glorious radiance. Our God approaches and he will not be silent. Fire devours everything in his way. God and great, a great storm rages around him. God calls on the heavens above and the earth below to witness the judgment of his people. Bring my faithful people to me. Gosh, get that. Those who made a covenant with me by giving sacrifices, let the heavens proclaim his justice, for God himself will be the judge. Keep in mind, God right now is inviting everyone. God is basically saying, y'all get in here right now. God is about to have a meeting. 
And this is like picking up on the Isaiah 58 passage. And he's saying to everybody in Psalm 50, get yourself in here now. God's about to drop some info. So can I, if I just get you guys to listen for the next couple of verses, God is going to say some of the most important, the most imperative words we could ever get. Literally, God is responding to the, if you want to know if I've ever had enough, listen to what I'm about to say. Words. This is what he says. My people listen to me. He said, my people, comma, listen to me as I speak. Here are my charges against you, O Israel, O Tacoma, O Puget Sound Foursquare Church. I am your God. I am God, your God, exclamation point. I have no complaint about your sacrifices or the burnt offerings that you constantly offer. Listen to what he says here, verse 9. But I do not need the bulls from your barns or the goats from your pens. For all the animals in the forest are already mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains. All the animals in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For all the world is mine and everything in it. Do I eat the meat of bulls? Do I drink the blood of goats? Listen, he's trying to just make a point here. God's saying, hey, listen, I don't need your stuff. It's cute that you dropped a thousand bucks in the offering. It's really great that you came and lifted your hands in worship, thinking that was going to make me, like you owed me one. It's great you did that. Thanks. But I didn't need that. Uh, Listen to what he's about to say here. This is the most important thing. Verse 14. Make thankfulness your sacrifice to God. Keep the vows that you made from on high. Then call on me in your time of trouble and I will rescue you and you will give me glory. Let me spell that out. I don't need your stuff. What I want instead is your heart. I don't want your stuff. What I need instead is your heart. Guys, some of us have been so conditioned to just tell God, well, I'll just, I'll give you a penitent offering. Uh, Here, here, here. I'll I'll, I'll go online and I'll give it. I'll I'll just give a little bit. I know what I'll do, God. I'll just, I'll go mow my neighbor's lawn. I know what I'll do. I'll just, I'll say I'm sorry to the person I wronged. I, that's what I'll do. That'll make you happy. I'll appease you. Stop it. God's saying, listen, I don't need your stuff or your things. I just want your heart. That's it. When we tear back all the things, he's like, I, got, I built the world. I, I, got the, I, I got it all. I got the birds. I got the mountains. I got the cattle. I got it all. I don't need your stuff. It's my stuff. I put it there. All I want is you. When are you going to finally realize all I want is you? That's the message today. All I want is you. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the end of the sermon. I just want to tell you, you got a choice. That You don't have to run off and I could invite you up here and kneel down. We could have a teary, cryy moment. We could have all that stuff, right? It's going to be important. I think you need to have that moment, but it's got to be between you and him. It's not going to be because we have soft music playing and Beth's up here doing that. We're going to have these these handouts to you in a minute. I'm going to have the ushers hand these things out for you to take home with you and reflect on what you've heard. But we'll have that in a minute. But before you do that, I just want to tell you this. You got some business to do with God. And the business is just between you and him. Will you give God your heart? I don't need, maybe you need to get saved. Maybe you need to get realigned with him. Maybe that's the case. But some of you know what I'm talking about. You just fully say, God, man, you got me. I've not been doing it well. You got to get, you got to get it back to him. So Jesus, today we come and we give it to you. Come on now, just between you and him. Just respond, Jesus, I give you me. You, you know where I'm at. You saw right, you could see through the veneer. 
You can see the attempts I have and the, the phony. You can see the you can see the things I try to give you in place of my heart. God, there's been pain that's gotten in the way. Jesus, take away the pain. I, I just give it to you. I need you. I need it to just be between you and me, nothing. Nothing between you and me, God. Go ahead. Jesus, I need you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, you don't know this. Um, maybe some of you do. You'll notice that I, this is the same Bible. I recovered it. Um, I bought a piece of leather and um, went to Amazon and, and covered it. It's awesome, right? So um, texted my, uh, my, my staff and I was like, hey, I recovered my Bible. And they were like, yay. And I said, darn dog, ate my Bible, made a big thing of it. And my, my staff, you, you know, I thought they would be like, well, that dog... And uh, my staff, the loving, kind staff I have, <laughs> Diana on my staff, she goes, I have a word for you. And I said, what is that? Waiting for her to say, yeah, dogs are stupid, aren't they? All she said was, don't eat chips before you read your Bible. <laughs> she was right. I ate chips before I read my Bible. Ending up in this. <laughs> Listen. I'm having our ushers pass out a piece of paper for you. I want you to take this home. Read the front. It'll tell you what to do. Put it in your Bible. Bring it back with you on Thursday. I want you to reflect over what you received over this last three weeks, 21 United. Come back next Sunday, and we're going to have an opportunity for us to be together. Reflect and celebrate our 21 United time. But God's spoken to you, what we've done. And so come. It's going to be a lot of fun. In Jesus' name. My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one. He will never He will never fail. Mm. Aye. Amen. Well, God bless you. Why don't you stand to your feet? You got one of those? Be blessed as you go. Be encouraged. Give someone a hug before you leave. Oh, thank you.